Okay. Hi, I'm Ferris. Who's new here, by the way? Oh, lots of new faces. Dylan, you're so new, it's not even funny. Um, this is the Salt Lake City Python group. This group was started almost five years ago. Can you believe that, Dylan? Yeah. Huh. Um, that is, that's going to be a bit of a milestone. Uh, in February of 2014, um, we started in a little place called Zaniac in Sugar House, and we were started because we didn't want to drive all the way to Draper to go to a meetup group for Python. <laughs> so, five at five o'clock in, in Salt Lake Metro area rush hour, which is not, it's not a fun thing. So, this started in that little place, and then we moved around a bunch of different places, and now we're here at the U. I'm Ferris. Um, I helped start this meetup along with Joe Reese, who's not here today, and Ken Myers, but also Dylan was like one of our first members here. That's why he's so new to the meetup. Um, we exist, let's see, so we actually have to do like a mission statement now, which Dylan and I will talk about maybe after this, because we're going through 501c3 whatever registration, all the nonprofit stuff. Are you seeing something, Dylan? I feel like I'm you're... I'm trying to write down the URL. Oh, it's in the meetup group. Yeah. It's the first comment, so that is the one that you can use. If you were to just hook into this one, you will be declined, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a new, we had to go away from Etherpad. So this is an Etherpad, so anybody with the URL that's in the meetup um, can edit this. Um, yeah. So this is Salt Lake City Python. Uh, Utah Python exists to help out all of the Python community and the tech community in general in Utah. Um, so there's a few meetup groups that are also Python groups. Um, Utah North, they're based in Logan. My pops runs that one. He didn't used to, but he decided that he's going to. Um, we also have Python at the Point, which is in, ah, I, I had the name this morning. It's in Lehigh. Lehigh, but I remember, I forgot the name of the... Canopy. Canopy, that was it. I always want to say Needle, because that's where it used to be, but no, it's at Canopy. And they are, I believe, this, the third Thursday? Anybody know off Do you know? They're actually next Thursday. Next Thursday, so, I think next Thursday. Thursday, so second Thursday. Um, and there's also the Data Engineering Meetup. Anybody have, do you know when those are? Yeah, it's the third Wednesday, and so it won't be next week, but it's the week following. We're right. talking about data pipelines and Kubernetes. And will that one be at... Uh, Recursion, recursion. They're jumping around. They are jumping around. Yeah. Whoa, they went to recursion? Yeah. That's like their arch enemy. That's funny. Um, so we all, we all fam. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, so yeah, that there, there's a bunch of little groups around here. There's also Girl Develop It. Um, Girl Develop It is a great little organization that uh, sponsors workshops around the valley. Um, if you are interested in teaching a workshop or attending, definitely check out that site. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a girl, but you do have to be developing it. Um, yeah, they, they, for example, I gave a Django workshop at the time, or sorry, a Flask workshop, Ooh, it was so long ago, and Zaniac at the time offered childcare, so that's really important for getting more women developers, we noticed um, when I was talking to their coordinators. Um, and the Pi Ladies. Anybody part of Pi Ladies or Girl Develop It, by the way? Howdy. Do you want to give a quick spiel about Pi Ladies? Uh, that's Jeff's job. Um, it meets when the last Wednesday of the month. Yeah. Basically, this month it's a week earlier than Halloween. Um, and I believe it's going to be an actual process. Oh, sweet. NLP. That's cool stuff. Um, and is Carrie still running that? Jess. Jess. Okay. Fun. Um, websites, slcpi.com, it exists. 
it doesn't auto update the way I thought it would, so I need to fix it a little bit. But that'll, that's fun. They're on GitHub repos. UtahPython.org is a static site. Both of these are up there on GitHub repos. Whenever we give a specific talk, um, what I'll do is I'll fork it to this repo over here. Um, yeah, sponsors. Pythonistas like you. Thank you. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Thank you so much if you donated $5 or if you didn't, just being here, taking the time out of your Wednesday. To me, that's a form of sponsorship. But for the monetary stuff, we got to talk about X Mission. X Mission has just hit their 10,000th customer on Utopia. Correct me on this, right? X Mission is organic, it's locally owned and operated. <laughs> and yeah. It's, uh, it's gluten-free, <laughs> it's vegan, it's all the things that you want out of an ISP. Um, they respect your privacy, um, Pashdown, aka Pete Ashdown, um, he's constantly writing on the blog, on his own blog and the exhibition blog about respecting privacy. He's the one that, you know, I'll randomly see him on KSL as an internet expert, which is kind of funny. but. Yeah, so X Mission is your local ISP that actually has your interests in heart. Um, yeah, and they've been sponsoring this meetup for a year. I think this is the year, like as of this meetup. So, all the pizza, all the, all this stuff, like, probably they sponsor about eighty percent of it. So, yeah, if you if you're thinking of considering, uh, or sorry, if you're considering switching ISPs, switch to X Mission. Is that a good spiel? Awesome. Okay. Sweet. Now earned our exhibition bucks. Um, uh, the University of Utah has sponsored this venue for almost two years now, right? Yeah, Dylan, it's been that long. It's pretty crazy. Probably a year and a half. Yeah, because I switched jobs and then two months after we got this venue, so that's pretty fun. Um, speaking of sponsorship and prizes, tonight we Wait, have. Oh, oh, are we oh. going to have another sponsor? It's going to pay for all the administrative fees. For so, I can neither confirm nor deny this right now because I'm still talking to people. Because oh, it turns out okay. I'd have to use my. Okay, so fun fact I work at Team, um, and people who've been following the startup scene might have realized we got acquired and valued for $100 million, which is really fun. By the way, when you get acquired for $100 million, as a lowly employee, that means you get 10 bucks in equity. It's great, yeah, it's a great pie. Hey, I know. <laughs> yeah, you get like half a lunch, like, oh, and a, a lunch celebration. No, it was pretty, it's been pretty, how, how do you say, tumultuous, that's, that's the word I'm gonna go with. Okay. But in a positive way, like, <laughs> like, you're like competing in a sailboat competition and there's a big storm, but you're with a good crew, so it doesn't really matter, because you know you're all gonna make it. That kind of tumultuous, but anyway, um, WeWork also owns another company that you might have heard of called meetup.com. So now that we're part of the same company, we may be getting sponsored by WeWork slash in, in at least the form of um, they'll pay the organizer fees, which is like $98 every six months. So about $200 a year, which is great. Um, but on top of that, and this is public knowledge now, so I can say this, is that they are planning on building a WeWork space in like downtown. So maybe we'll switch spaces one of our meetups and you guys can check out, hey, this is like a WeWork space. But I'm really liking having him at the U, so probably won't be permanent, but we'll see. It depends on what the corporate How overlords. Nice yeah, like, yeah, that too. I have not been in one of their spaces yet. The, the number one factor would probably be parking because the U does charge for that but I don't think it's been that much of a deter deterrent, and I really like having this at the U, so. Did anybody have trouble parking? I don't think anybody did, so. But this might be selection bias, Dylan. All right, because if you had trouble parking, then you wouldn't be here, so. <laughs> Next, I gotta go message everybody on the board and see how much bias is. Right, right. <laughs> Um, this is the Python Data Science Handbook, written by Jake Vanderplas. He is a common fixture at many a PyCon and many a, uh, not our meetup, but a few meetups. Um, he is an astronomer. Yes. Um, astronomy yes, so this is, this is a really good starting point. Um, this one's a little bit more heavy from what I was reading, but this is the Python Machine Learning 2nd Edition. 
Um, you might notice there's no Django books here. This was originally supposed to be the web dev meetup, but you damn data scientists keep taking everything over, so. Um, and we're going to give away a couple stickers, I think. Um, so, yeah, we'll do four giveaways, and then you get to pick whatever you want. These stickers are awesome. Um, you can buy these online, and it directly supports the meetup. And we have shirts that have the same thing. And for those colder months, we also have hoodies. All of those details are found in that link right up here. I'm like pointing at nothing, guys. Right there. So Teespring stores SLC Python. So while we're doing introdu introductions, oh, I need to delete this. Tim gets a permanent spot unless you got a thing. Tim got a job. Okay, Tim got a job. <laughs> working for Overstock. Oh. Yeah. Good for overstock, seriously. As a machine learning science. Ooh. <laughs> so, yeah, before we get going with that part, though, let's do some intros. We got a lot of new people, so I'm going to show you how this works. Is If you're new, you get to introduce yourself. And you all raised your hand, so I'm going to be able to tell who didn't. Um, you're going to just tell us your name, what you're doing, and your favorite Halloween costume, something non-Cody. So, I'm Ferris. I'm the senior back-end janitor at Team, um, and my favorite Halloween costume has to be when uh, like toddlers dress up in those pumpkin costumes, because I think it's super adorable. I know. I'm lame like that. But anyway, who else wants to introduce themselves? I'm just going to pick people, guys. All right. Thank you. Dylan. Yeah, Dylan picked for me. Uh, Dustin Webb. I am a student here at the U, actually graduating this semester, and I started the Dustin Webb, deep learning, machine learning. As far as favorite costumes, um, I have one off the top of my head. Uh, my girlfriend and I did a Barbie and Kim costume a couple of years ago. Last year, I think it was. I'm pretty bad. Nice. <laughs> well, you get to pick the next person who's new, because you know all the new people now, because we had pizza together. <laughs> you think I would have been Let's go, Paul. Okay. I'm, I'm Paul. Um, I'm a student here, uh, undergrad in math. I also work upstairs at CHPC, um, and uh, I guess my, my birthday is on Halloween, so I think I can say that uh, I don't have a favorite. I don't. My favorite costume is not wearing one. Halloween's my birthday, so Halloween. You should get that costume on Amazon with like somebody jumping out of a birthday cake. Seriously, think about it. Uh, pick on somebody. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. I'm McKay, as has just been mentioned. Um, I'm also a student at the U, um, also studying math. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, let's, uh, favorite Halloween costume? You know, I have no idea. I'd have to think about this for a while. Um, just pick one off the top of your head. <sighs> I don't know, you know. <laughs> Halloween's not my thing. But, uh, That's fair. Pass on that one. I'll, I'll Any share. Costume is scary. Yeah. <laughs> An anecdote at Primary Children's, they are allowing us to wear costumes this year, but there's a giant list of stuff you cannot wear as <laughs> at Primary Children's. And on that list, somewhat surprisingly, maybe not too surprisingly, is angels. You cannot dress up like an angel, which seemed kind of morbid to me, but anyway, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian. Um, two main things. I. I'm a technical support engineer at Visa in Lehigh, and I'm also the community coordinator for an open source science fiction franchise. What? Yeah. Yes. It's pretty cool. We're going to switch details. Okay. Uh, yes. Absolutely. We're always looking for server development people right now, because we're building a custom content management system. Um, yeah. Let's talk. I need help. Um, and probably my favorite Halloween costume are either like the creative ones that you can tell the kids made, like the one where they're like riding a horse made out of like toilet paper tubes, or like the creative ones that like adults make, like the giant like alien forklift costumes and stuff like that with their kids in them. Yeah. So those are great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, who else is new? <coughs> I see new faces. Boom, in the back. The red shirt. Uh, Jake Packer, I work with data science company in Salt Lake. And I think I'm on costume. Santa Claus, <laughs> like night before Christmas style or like nightmare before. Very nice. 
That's, I feel like that would infuriate me more than any other costume. Because, you know, the day after Halloween, you're already seeing, like, Christmas tree stuff. Right? Day of Halloween. Day of, yes, that's true. That's true. I think Costco already has Christmas stuff, but I'm not even going to think about that. Anyway, who else is new? Go ahead. My niece was great one year, and there was a bunch of balloons just taped to her, and it was, it was pretty cute. Cool. Awesome. How old's your niece? That's, see, that's adorable, that's what I'm saying. Any fruit or vegetable with a toddler is just, I don't know. Who else is new? I'm Tim, I'm a, I work in computational physics and mathematics at Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, and I'm an adjunct professor here in mechanical engineering. And my, I, have, I have one year old twins, and they're going to be crabs this year. So they're the cutest crabs you've ever seen. <laughs> ah. Now I feel like I should have people like just post pictures on the meetup. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead. Who's this guy with the hat? I am Ben Smith. Uh, I work at Team with these fellas. Uh, I do predominantly React, C Sharp, some Django, and some Ember. Um, too many things. Uh, I my favorite Halloween costume is dressing up like a coworker. Um, <laughs> One year there was a guy who always wore like gray button up short sleeve shirts with like those orange glasses and like black boots, so I wore that. This year I'm going to dress up as Dave. Nice. He uh, always wears black. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to go as a taco this year, so. Chris, were you there for Chanto No, I missed it by one, by three months, too, so. I'll show you a photo. Yeah. We did a pretty good one for um, the Sysadmin. I'll have to all. Ben was also our uh, Python. Uh, fireman for a few months when he first started, so he was putting out fires. Yes, he he dressed up like a fireman. It was pretty awesome. No, he didn't. Anyway, who else is new? I'm new. I'm Joe Kaplan. Uh, my wife and I just moved to Salt Lake about a week ago. So. I'm Welcome to Utah. to Utah or Salt Lake. Are you for? And, and Utah. Yeah, we moved most recently from the Bay. Um, I another lovely for uh, 23 and me, which is headquartered in. Mountain View. Oh, nice. So, I mean, you work for Ancestry, I can please. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I mainly write Python code to build uh, data pipelines for our researchers who do all kinds of cool research on the data that we have. Um, and mm -hmm. Halloween costume wise, my favorite uh, is from when my siblings and I were kids. Um, I had a younger brother and a younger sister. And probably I was nine, and they were seven, five, and four. And we, we dressed up as Yakko, Rakko, and Dot. Yes! Right? It's sort of I think that one wins. Popularity and it was, it was pretty That's awesome. Well, welcome. Uh, another California refugee. That's what I keep telling people. It's like, you could actually buy a house here. Isn't that cool? <laughs> like, um, yeah, I'm sure everybody in this room is probably going to give you like five awesome places to go to in the valley that you'll be like, hey, this is like that one place that I used to go to in the Bay a lot, but it doesn't cost an arm and a leg, just an arm. So, welcome. Uh, yeah, who else is new? Hey, I'm Chris Rames. I work in data and analytics, that's what I've been doing for a while. And I founded uh, recently a startup called Write Data. And uh, my favorite Halloween costume would have to be Green Lantern. The Green Lantern. That was my favorite. Nice. I'm so sorry about that DC movie. Just. I don't think in the movie he didn't make the best things with yeah. his ring, but exactly. Anyway. Um, <coughs> who else? Anybody else who's new? Go on once. Come on. Oh, go twice. All right. Well, here's the next part we got, which is who's hiring and who's looking. So, if you're, you know, just trying to dive into something, or if you actually right now, if you know somebody who's hiring in the valley. Now's, now's the time to speak up. So team is hiring. There's the link. They're always hiring. Anybody else? Yes. Ancestry is hiring. Do you know what positions? What's that? Do you know what position? Um, the ones I know about are software engineering. Um, software engineering. Dylan, do you have that pulled up or do I have to type?
Who else is hiring? I'll let Dylan be the scribe. So this, it's really for my client, um, iOS developer, but also if they have, if anyone has Golang, Angular, RESTful APIs, or GraphQL experience, talk to me. They have an immediate need. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Golang, iOS, and what was the other one? Yeah, Golang, iOS, Angular, uh, and rest, just rest APIs. What was the company, or do you just want them you to go through? You can talk to me and write data. Okay. Sweet. Uh, who else? Anybody else know of anybody hiring in the Valley? STG is always hiring. STG is always hiring. And STG. if you talk to me, I'll talk to the person who recruited me, and can see what like to learn about. Sweet. <laughs> if uh, any of the students are interested in an internship at a national lab where you can work with nuclear weapons, with nuclear weapons? Because that sounds great. Or nuclear. Yeah. yeah. And you'd have to move to Albuquerque, Mexico. No, it has or to be a so valley job. I'm just saying. But yeah, no, that sounds cool. It doesn't have to be a valley job. I'm just kidding. Um, but don't take my Python use this way. Uh, national like labs? Come back and work in your basement in the it's like that kid who built the cyclotron in his basement. That was pretty fun. Um, sweet. Going once, going twice. Anybody else? Awesome. Who's looking? If you would like to make a statement, this is the part where you actually have to stand up and introduce and market yourself and be like, hey, I'm so and so. and Give us your contact details. Tim had like a standing spot on here for two months though, because he's just that awesome. Your but dad is. <laughs> my dad did too. That was that was he would just paste that right in there and then yeah. Is this looking for jobs or looking for clients? If you are a person who, who is looking to be employed in one way or another. Okay, fair enough. I am actually in that position there. Alright, stand up. Introduce yourself. Uh, I believe I did that. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the name of the company yet. Uh, I would like to actually have some of you look at the graphic, the, uh, a logo, and my graphic designer just sent me. Just so you can tell what it says. You know, a little concerned with the, the typeface that was used, right? That said, uh, I've been doing research here in robotics and deep learning, and I have done uh, software engineering for 20 years at every level. I've done everything from assembly, uh, from C++, HTML, CSS, Python, PHP, you name the language, I've probably toyed in it for some period of time. Um, I work with every kind of database you can think of, so I have a lot of skills, I know what I'm doing, and uh, lately I'm focused on machine learning and deep learning specifically, so I'm really interested in clients that need help with artificial intelligence of some form. Awesome. <laughs> AI. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else who's looking? Want to stand up and market yourself? Okay, that's fine. I always like it when there's more people who are uh, not looking. <laughs> Damn it, Dylan. There we go. Um, <laughs> I am staying out. <laughs> uh, community news. Anybody go to DEF CON? That was a while ago, but, you know, nerd Burning Man. <laughs> Sweet. Django 2.1 was released. Be sure to update if you're on that. PyCharm was updated. Uh, Guido stepped down as BDFL. This is old news, eh? Mm -hmm. It's almost like somebody like copied and pasted this stuff from the last meetup. Anyway, uh, the Big Mountain Data Conference is October 12 through 13. Anybody going to that? Yeah. Is X Mission sponsoring or anything, or just just showing up? Sweet. And where is that, by the way? It's down at Goldman Sachs. Okay. It's free to get into. There's, it's going to be for two days. Nice. Have a lot of machine learning, data science, Python, cloud computing, everything. Wow. That sounds like it would be a great place for students of mathematics at the U to go to for free and network. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> The Big it's Mountain Data Conference. Yeah. Hacktoberfest. Who put that in? Is that? Oh, you want to explain what it is? Um, Hacktoberfest is a, a thing that GitHub and DigitalOcean put together. And if you submit five PRs, 
do anything, they'll send you t-shirts and stickers. And Microsoft has a thing where if you do a PR to one of their repositories, they'll give you another t-shirt. Yep. And so I actually... You your open source work to last over last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you can give us five PRs onto our website. Do you have an either your kind of enough? I haven't even started looking yet. Yeah, okay. It's beginning of the <laughs> You can look for Hacktoberfest tags in GitHub yeah. for a lot of projects yeah. right now, too. And you can substitute those with good first PRs. Like, there's a lot of open issues. One that I saw today, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I'll have to look it up. I'll post it later. But basically, it's an open source screen uh, uh, typewriter, or sorry, keyboard, but it uses your webcam to track your eyes, and it's made for people with locked in syndrome, but it's the only open source one out there. So I thought that might be a really nifty one to, to look at. A um, lot of interesting, even if you're just looking, there's a lot of interesting stuff they're doing to track eye movement um, in real time. You mentioned that you need work on your website. Sorry? You mentioned that you on the Salt Lake City Python website. Well, we, I just need somebody to literally update um, the day from October to November, and then push it. And then. <laughs> <laughs> no, Hashtag, no first PR. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad one. Um, the reach goal would be, I wrote, I wrote a little program on SLCPy, so you can do pip install Utah, <laughs> and then you can do utah.howdy, and that'll tell you, um, or sorry, from Utah import SLC Python and then SLC Python dot howdy, and it'll tell you the next meetup. So that's a pretty fun one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other community news we know of? I'm gonna put team got acquired. That way, my corporate overlords will know that <coughs> I said something about it. Okay. Is, Bye. It, is that the hashtag? The good first PR is that what you said? I think so, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Might want to double check it. Um, That's what I was trying. There's not a good like, ticket searcher. Maybe I'm not finding it. It's per project. It's not one that you can just grab. But they'll have, if you go to Hacktoberfest, it'll have a list of really good stuff to look at. Like, yeah. All right. While Dylan's looking that up, let's talk about our next few meetups. So. I messed up this month. That's my bad. Usually I do a bring your own Python meetup in between a talk meetup, but this month kind of got hectic, you know, because the future is amazing and all that. That's the phrase that we've been saying at team about WeWork. But anyway, things have gone, been kind of nuts this month. So I didn't find a speaker. I couldn't find a speaker. Nobody wanted to be a speaker. But, but now you have a month plus seven days because the next meetup's on the 7th. It's rare we get a seven. Uh, Wednesday the seventh meetup, so you get a full week to procrastinate to. So <laughs> while you're thinking up uh, a talk, I would like to try to get at least two speakers for our next meetup. So if you've ever considered giving a talk, but like you're like, oh no, it's too much pressure. Just look at me and how awkward I am up here, <laughs> and know that you are in good company for giving a talk. Um, a beginning level talk is what we're looking for and then intermediate or advanced. But I'd like to do an, a beginning one level talk at every meetup, and the length is up to you. Just hit me up. Does anybody have a talk in mind they've been wanting to work on? Yes? Hit me up at the end, please, both of you, and you'll both probably end up being the speakers. And, <laughs> and then December as well will be open. So if you have like a, a longer talk that you've had in mind, um, again, meetups are one of the best places to present on stuff. I think I'm going to try to do a talk this December on uh, API development that I want to refine and submit to PyCon. So I'm going to cross my fingers. And I don't want to jinx it by letting out my wish into the world, but that's something I know, right? <laughs> but I'm going to work on it. That's my commitment for the next couple of months is to work on a really good talk about restaurant menus and APIs and comparing the two. and yeah. Yeah. And then Dylan will be like, no, don't do this talk at all. It's not going to be That's what happened, Paris. That's, but, happen, yeah, that's, that's, that's my goal, but I would like at least one more person for December. So you two hit me up at the end of this. And yeah. And then here's a bunch of topics that people have wanted for a while. Oh, my. 
Yeah. So there's a lot here. You could potentially even just grab one of these topics and teach it to yourself and then teach it to everybody else. So this, this is where the professional development of this uh, meetup comes in. It's not all about the pizza, but it's mostly about the pizza. Um, raspberry Pi hats of awesomeness is one I've wanted to do for a while. So I give out Raspberry Pis here like candy, although I shouldn't say that because I don't have them. But, um, but there's these things called hats, which are really just shields that you can put on the Raspberry Pi and then just super easily code interesting stuff. They have stuff, everything from like home brewing beer to like managing like all the lights in your house. So maybe somebody could do a talk on that potentially. Um, anybody does a talk on that, I will make sure we have Raspberry Pis to give away. So, yes, just hit me up. You don't have to hit me up now. Just approach me at the end of this meetup or just message me at meetup.com. Um, one more thing. Who here would consider themselves fairly well versed in Python? We're going to go, actually, I've code, okay. Raise your hand if this, this uh, statement describes you. I've never coded in Python, but that's why I'm here. I want to learn about Python. Okay, I've coded in Python for a year, two years, three years, keep your hands raised, four years, five years. Dylan, have you? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sweet. Five plus years. I would like to have a couple of those people. I've got one more oh. question for that. Who um, is coding in Python daily? Like just yeah, a on, on a regular. Sweet. So I would like one of those people who just raised their hand, or two of those people, you can come up here and join. And how we're going to do tonight's talk is what we're going to happen is just open the floor to questions. And then I'm going to sketch them down real quick just to get them. And then we'll go in order from easiest to hardest. And we'll open the floor to answering the questions. Anybody on the panel who's like, oh, yeah, I think I have a good approach to this, we'll Google around. But while we're setting up, we're going to take a quick five minute break. But if you want to be one of those people, please come up here. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, grab some water. I'm going to pause this. Do, 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 do. This is also a good time to talk to Dustin.
I'm writing them down. Oh, perfect. What does a hash slice do? Uh, no, sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> we'll, we'll Let's get a couple down. Just interesting. I know. <laughs> ask anything right now. Like, I thought really. John. So this is kind of an anaconda one. So if I reinstall anaconda, will that update every single library? So like if I'm trying to sync up like SciPy and NumPy and like Scikit-learn and Matplotlib. So what happens to those lives? Yeah. Okay. I think I have a good answer for that. Ferris, I think you're the first person I've heard pronounce that lives. Yeah. The loops. Yeah. Lives. Or not library, right? <laughs> Can you? I feel like I feel like loops is like something like Bill O'Reilly would call me like a dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so you say fine or bin? No, I say bin. I'm not bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we called it bulk today. We could do a lot of these. We can keep thinking of some. Lexi. Yeah. Um, this is probably a level zero question. The question is, uh, what is API? What is an API? Mm -hmm. That's basically my job right now. <laughs> is explaining it or doing it? It's a small business at nurse. Yeah. <laughs> This will be a fun one. We'll start with, we'll with this, with that one. What is it? So I have a follow-up question. Um, what are some ways to implement or design distributed APIs in Python and translate data types between things like XML or JSON to internal Python data structures? So distributed APIs? Yeah. Like legacy code to? Not necessarily. Um, think about like communications at the cluster but communication from outside the cluster is in non-native data structures. Ooh, so like you three. Okay. I'll, I'm probably gonna have you reiterate this question when we get to it. Okay, that's fine. Awesome. Let's try to get a couple more. Nobody's gonna ask like, how do I best <coughs> run Python on Windows? That's one. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a pain in the butt, like, how do I compile from source on your things? How do you hear about? You sit with. I heard there's a new one actually that's better than sit with, but WSL. I think that was it. I don't know. Windows. Don, you have your hand up. Yeah, this is one for it's a tableau, it's I Tab Pi, if anybody's used it, have they done it in uh, Jupyter Notebooks? Tab Pi. We can at least Google it together. I know that Lexi's interested in Tableau, so. I, I used to be a Tableau developer, but I haven't used it for a while, so. This is like some sort of native Python? Tableau is a, you know Tableau, right? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. I, I installed it and played around not at X Yeah. Um, so I've used Jupyter Notebooks a lot, but I've never actually just used normal IPython like in my terminal. So I guess I'm wondering, like, what, how do I just use IPython? Because I think that can be faster to do what I want to do. Okay. Really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, going once. Any other Could questions? Going twice? All right. So uh, just a quick thank you to our panel here, Tim and Dylan. Um, just for being on the panel, I'm going to give you guys some stickers, but we'll do that later. You have to actually answer questions. You're going to earn <laughs> the stickers, OK? Um, let's start with. I'm, yeah, i got an order going. So what API, API, parsing API, hash pearls, then we could talk about installations, I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, and then. Then do Tab we, Pi, I think, is a two. OK. And so these two would go together in my yeah, like nice. clustering like algorithm. When do you want to do the, the NLP? NLP classification. Let's tackle it at the end. Is that OK? Yeah. Sweet. OK. Well, 
what is an API? Um, I'm going to have a crack at this one if that's okay. So, you walk into Chipotle, okay? And they have a big menu of stuff, right? And what do you do? You have to ask them, I want this, 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 and this on the menu. And they say, give me money. And then you give the money, and then you get Chipotle, which is great. Um, an API is one of the ways that applications can make these promises and responses to each other. That's how I like to think about it. Now, this is definitely an overextended metaphor, but for example, on the web, we have uh, very specified HTTP APIs. So um, a good example of that would be, I know that this application, it shows me when the next Python meetup is, right? It's meetups API, right? So I go to slash meetup, or sorry, API, meetup.com slash API slash meetups slash, I know what the meetup ID is, like I know our meetup ID is 1100 something, um, yeah, there you go. Um, and I can say users, or I can say slash upcoming meetup. Now let's say I want to just get the upcoming meetup, and I just I don't need to write to it. I don't need to tell it anything. I just I'm saying, hey, get me the next meetup. It, there is an API call for that. Um, all of this stuff is documented, so you can think of that as like the menu of Chipotle. Okay. Um, but let's say I want to change. Let's, let's actually go. Let's go look at that. So yeah. meetup.com API. You can usually search API stands for application interface. It's the way that the computers are talking to each other, the same way the Chipotle. And a lot of them have documentation. You can just search like this. Oh, this is a beautiful, beautiful example. Good job, Meetup. Okay. So there's all these little extra like. Yeah. Those are not real. Those are just these things. So, yeah, yeah. So look, they, they're they're trying to indicate little stuff here, here, here. So first we have the API host. Okay, that's me api.meetup.com. Then we have a method that you're calling, which is the path. So what do we want to do? Find groups. Then you have arguments, which is stuff that you'd pass just like in a command line tool. You have arguments or just like extra cheese and hold the guac, because I can't afford guac. Like, those are arguments. Um, in this case, order is another argument. You can think of like how I want that sorted. Um, so in this case, order it by members. So this whole thing is saying, find groups in this zip code with a radius of one. And you know what's funny is that sometimes you need to look stuff up, like is this one kilometer or one mile? Right. Category, you don't know what the category numbers are. So you'd have to look that up in a document like this and order it by members. Yeah. So. so, yeah, again, that, that first part is this, it's going to be the machine, like the server, the computer that's going to handle the request. And the next is the information about the request. And like a lot, a lot of APIs you can see along this side. So if we want to look at um, events. So this shows us, OK, so the first thing would be that server we're going to send it to. Now there's the path that I'm going to send it to. Um, and then uh, these are all of the options on the menu. Um, and then APIs will also tell you very often, this is the kind of data you're going to get back. This is what I'm going to give you back. And it's essentially this contract between what you're allowed to ask for and what I will return when you ask that. So um, let's see what their console looks about. like. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, nope, got to log in. in. Um, so that's part of. The important parts of meetups, or sorry, of APIs, is that sometimes you have to authenticate, sometimes you don't. Um, if you want to push something to the server, let's say you're making a brand new object, a brand new meetup, um, we have different verbs for those kinds of actions. So a post would be in an HTTP API. It means I want to create something. A patch means I want to update one small part of it. Um, update would mean change the whole object, but keep the object. I have the ID already. And delete would just drop it, just delete it. Um, and writing this stuff is all I do all day for a living, for the record. So, <laughs> um, some Python frameworks. Do we want to get into frameworks? Or do you want to? Um, I just want to make one more comment on that. So, the operations that you can do, there's 
There's a type of API that's called uh, that's RESTful, right? Um, is what Ferris just described, um, and that refers to a particular way that you interact with the data on the other side. Um, and RESTful inter interactions typically involve like I want to retrieve the data, I want to um, uh, create new data, I want to delete, and I, or I want to uh, update. And they call that CRUD: create, read, uh, update, destroy. Yes, um, and so those are CRUD operations in a RESTful framework. Um, that's not true of all frameworks. What was the, you are thinking about using Facebook's, what was, what's the name of Facebook's one? Or GitHub, has, are you talking about GraphQL? Yeah, didn't you, oh, you mentioned that as your yeah. part. GraphQL is a different standard than REST. The basic operations are you send to some URL you send some particular formatted information to request it. In REST, what we just showed with all of these like parameters, that would be RESTful. For GraphQL, you send in the body, you actually send some data, and then the server will respond in kind. Right. I would say in general, the REST API is serializing data using a URL, but Something like XML RPC is going to serialize it in XML, and JSON RPC is going to serialize it in JSON. And so you can just think of different ways of packaging up these requests, and REST is one way of serializing that, that question and answer. And XML RPC is one, GraphQL is one, and there's one. The right. There's many different ways. The dominant one is REST, yeah. but GraphQL is starting to make inroads and open, and I'm referring to the open source community, some older ones are SOAP, right? Yeah. Where SOAP is basically, I have a giant binary thing and just use that to make your calls and I'll tell you what the methods are, but like, it, it is, yeah. And it can be a pain in the butt to use, especially with Python. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I think even things like OpenGL are considered APIs sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to right. do with REST or even... It doesn't even have to do with the web, yeah. Right. So API is um, a way that you can get computers to talk to each other. So let's say, let's say I have, I don't know, what's, what's the second question with API coming up? Well, so, so we, yeah, what you're saying is an external, which is what we've been describing, yeah. like a web-based API versus an internal API, um, which, like, for... Python, you might say the, um, let's give a good example. If it's called Utah. It's called Utah. Well, well, there's there's the, uh, um, in uh, Python OS, the path right. API. So path is a way to access your file system. Um, well, we want the Python 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so what they're, what they're setting up is there's like, here are some methods. Here's your, here's your way you can request things from our, um, this interface. And this particular interface is going to then communicate for you with your file system in this case. But it's providing an application layer where you have this amount of application code um, abstracting some other service, in this case, your file system. And in the web case, it's abstracting some sort of backend server. Right. So instead of you know manipulating this file system with change of directory, do this and that. Um, this is an easy way to do it in your programming language of choice. I'm not sure. Should I make it more complex or just leave it at that? Well, I'll make it a little bit more complex. APIs can have APIs for the APIs. Um, so for example, you can get a Meetup API wrapper for Python which is just a Python API for a RESTful API. And that's actually what we're using with the import Utah, is I'm using something that somebody else wrote that goes and gets the request in a RESTful way so that I can get them in a Pythonic API way. So I could say, you know, create it, like go get a fetch a meetup and store it as a variable, take that variable and get the next meetup. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the background, I don't have to do it anymore. So. So what's a callback? Oh, what's a callback? You take the questions. 
<laughs> we, should, we should probably start timing it. We can take it. Yeah, let's take one more question on this. Yeah, one more question. What's a callback? Um, a callback is you go to Starbucks <laughs> and you right get, next to Chipotle. <laughs> right next to Chipotle. If you've ever gone to Starbucks, you order your coffee, they start making the coffee before you pay. The callback is the promise to pay, right? So they start saying, hey, I paid. Okay, Carol, Carol, here's your coffee, Carol. Like, that's one way of looking at a callback. I could be completely wrong, but I think it's a good way to look at it. Um, I, use, I use callbacks. Um, I write optimization software. So users will want to optimize a function, and I have no idea what it is. And so they send their function definition into my software, and then we just call it. I have no idea what it does. I have no idea how it works. I just know I promised I would call it with these arguments. Right. And we will optimize it. So the callback to us is a function you provide to me that I will then in turn call to do some work, whatever and, it may be. And you won't necessarily get the value back, but you will know what it's done, right? Or that's well, more I, asynchronous. Well, I mean, for, for optimization, you have to have right. the value back. Uh, yeah. yeah. And if, if you're a C++ programmer, all of the STL is callbacks. So you can sort numbers based on some new sort algorithm. And you provide a function that tells the sort algorithm how do you want to sort these things. But you have to provide the function, and that function is a callback. So I'd like to add that callback is a function that is called in response to another function being called. I call a function, I say when you're done, or sometime through your operation, call this other function. Sweet. APIs. Oh, this is bad worker. Okay. Um, what was the next one? Distributed API? Is that what we decided? Yeah, it's, it's the, the way to parse API data structures or... So, can I have some clarification? Yeah, dude. Yes, so, let's get this clarified. Yeah, so what we're doing here is, like I said, we're creating a custom content management system inspired in many ways by Git, but made for creative, non-technical, non-coding people so that they can upload whatever it is that they've worked on, be it a text document, a picture, a video, or things like that, into our version control system. And then from there, we can translate that into our server code, which we're using Flask and Python for, so that it can be used on the server side and then it can be called back on the outside. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let, me, let me try to repeat that back to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, you have, it's a content management system. People are writing various documents of any format? Basically. Okay, and then they upload it in some way to you. Correct. Um, then you store it probably on a file system in a Git version control, or you parse it using Git? So Git, because of the way that it handles data structures, doesn't do well with non-text-based data. Sure. So things such as images and videos, it really struggles with, especially with binary dipping and doing version control of those. Or Jupyter Notebooks, got it. Yeah, and so <laughs> from there, the current plan has been to put it into an SQL type database, where then things are sorted in a Git-like way. Again, we could. So are you leveraging Git at all in this? That's, this is probably off topic. We're looking at how we can, because Git has a really fantastic code base, but we just have to make it work with non-text-based data easily. It might not be too Pythonic except for the scripting. Well, well but, but, just, but your question, your question then is how do you use Python as the translation layer uh, for this type of data to translate into this type of data? Have you seen how GitHub has handled the large binary data lately? Like, not necessarily. Uh, I the can't problem is GitHub is is also, isn't also super open source, and so no, so it's, it's not. But they do have some aspects. Can you write a function to do it? If I thought. Is that something you can already do? Not yet. And that's, Interesting. maybe this is more of an involved question than a generic Possibly. Question. So what, and, but you asked the question about scaling it um, So in a clustered setting, is that right? Right. Yeah. So maybe we can skip past this question and come back to it later. Or I, I can give you something to look at. Okay. which would be Git LFS, which is an open source project. Um, it is specifically made 
to manage larger files and non-binary files with Git. Okay. It's written in Go. Okay. But perhaps looking at that code would inspire some? Or just use Go. <laughs> I mean, right tool for the right job. <laughs> get out. Just get out. <laughs> Python is the second best. What, what is the language. Utah Python website written in, Ferris? The Utah Python? Is it Utah Python or is it SLC's Python? It's SLC Python. SLC Python's Django. I did that on purpose. Utah Python is written in Django. <laughs> uh, but it's just a static hosted thing. Yeah, look at, look at git LFS. Um, okay. I don't think we have that much of an answer, but... Well, yeah, do you want to add anything to like this the is scaling? This is outside of my domain. Okay. What, do you, right. what do you use? So you said you, you get functions from a user and call it, and call that function. What do you use to scale that? What do you mean? To do multiple function calls, or do you use any sort of technology to... Like for a callback? Or in parallelization. What do you use to... I imagine the parallelizing like function calls. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what we're working on. Um, most, most of that kind of work could be done in C++. And so, okay. I mean, I, I can talk to you about it, but I, I'd have to understand what you're saying. But, but speaking of callbacks, everyone's, can I, can I write something? Sure. I think everybody here has used a callback, and I'll just put here, if we have a... Do you want to put it in the callback? Oh, but I'm going to have to write some real code. Oh, okay. So if I were to just write something easy, uh, and I do sort it A, well, it should just return A, right? Because sure. because it's already sorted, but I can do a callback to make it reversed. It, it provides a. Yeah, I mean, well, negative x uh, x modulus. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is, you know, put in put in something that's gonna. Put in negative x. Yeah. There you go, and now you've got a callback, where now you've told the sort key, call this new function, and this function will provide the predicate by which you will you will sort things. Um, so that's a little bit. Dylan's having too much fun. <laughs> <coughs> how do you get? How do you tell whether it's a an even or an odd number? Percent. Is it? Yeah, is it percent two. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. So so this would put all of my even numbers first, and all of my odd numbers yeah. second. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody? Yeah. Anybody have any questions on that? What we just did there. What's up next? The uh, run compile and installation? Uh, no, hash, hash slices. slices. Okay. This is a fun one. So, do you want to explain to us what a hash slice is? Yeah, I messaged you some Is this the Perl code? Yeah. yeah, that's why you can't read it. Wait, do I got like a... <laughs> yeah. Nope, not as cool. Okay, so you're creating some sort of object here. This is just an object definition? Some sort of object here. This is just an object definition? Is that right? So on the Perl side, that's, it's just creating a hash, which is a, it's a, it's a dictionary. Okay. And then I'm saying I'm summing up two of the values in the dictionary by those keys. You're summing two of the values by those keys. Yeah. Okay. So so the the end result here would be citrus, which would be five point three plus edamame. Yeah. And then the exactly equivalent code is below in Python. Okay. That's this is this is your end result, yeah. and then the equivalent code is here. So, off topic question: Why is it called hash slicing? Do you know? Well, Perl called it hashes because they stored dictionary keys as like, hash like a hash lookup table. Yeah. 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 So I keep using that but in the dictionary. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's my name. So, okay, so I guess I'm wondering, Matt, like, what's the, 
is is there a significant like so you, your question is could you recreate it in that? Well, I, no, my question is is there a better way to do it with less typing? You see how easy it is in Perl. Uh, Some doesn't have a call. Back. <laughs> <laughs> but or am I doing it in a non pythonic way? So I would say some of the things here, like we wouldn't usually define dictionaries using that sort of split, right? We would just uh, probably write out the dictionary, Apple, like that. Right? Yeah, probably you would use the string processing, so are you getting your data in string like that? Is that why you have to do that with your part? Uh, not necessarily. Sometimes configuration data ends up being stored that way mm -hmm. in Perl is because of the QW operator, which I can kind of emulate using split. Yeah. So, I mean, this looks fine. One of the things you don't need, there's an implicit uh, on that. Um, this dictionary zip and keys. It's a clever trick, though. And it's too clever. So he's jumping every other value. So this accessor says from the beginning to the end of the array, if you look at um, what x is, x is now a list separated by spaces. It's saying for every other element, and then also every other element starting from the first one. And he's casting this one to a float. One thing I could say is that you don't need for map, since float is a callable, you could just throw oh, that in. Okay. So that's a little cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, mapping is applying this function to every element, which is what we're doing, calling the float. Um, and then I would probably just, like if you're writing this out anyway, yeah. you'd be doing something like that, but that's essentially like, if, yeah, if you did like uh, keys here, where you're splitting, like Dustin said, for string processing. Boom. So then it's split out into the two. I mean, you don't need these. Technically, that's an optimization. Okay. Cool. You got your code awesome optimized by yeah. the Dylan. So yeah. I think, I think that's probably the most Pythonic way. Okay. Um, people are replacing this with the dot .format. Oh, yeah. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yeah. So there's two ways to do this sort of string casting. So if I have this as my contact and I do percent uh, 42, that'll put 42 into this particular location. Um, the other way to do that. Three ways. Okay, we'll get to that. I always mess up that. So yeah. that's the third, second way, and the third way. Oh. F. Put an F in front. And now put your variable where you have dot two F, and instead of and keep the percent. Now what's the variable name? Bar. <laughs> Is that what we really needed? I uh, know. I don't think there's a. Okay. Well, set up. Oh, oh, you're saying so, like, let's say I want to put edamame in. No, no. Local. Go, if it is a variable, it's a callable variable in there. Like a local in your stuff. Yeah. Just to find more, and it will automatically be. Okay. With that? Yeah, I think that'll do it. Yeah. Damn. Um, are you running Python 3.6? You got the one. Three five. Uh, <laughs> well, that's th something you can do in three six now. Ooh, should we talk about uh, IPython? Yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> <That's> segue. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is uh, make a virtual environment. So this um, uh, this creates because Python is open source. And in your environment, when you're installing different libraries, it's nice to keep them all contained so you don't, like, maybe one project you're working on needs this version, another project needs another version. Learning how to use virtual environments is really handy. So virtual environment minus minus Python equals Python 3.6. 
and we're going to call it pi 3, 6, 36. Is that right? You can't fit install Python. <laughs> no, but you could up, possibly upgrade it. No, but you can brew install Python 3.6. But it might take a while. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to it once we hit that. Or we'll just go with mine because I have a. Oh, yeah. Do you, do you have a 3.6? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, do you want to run that? And do, are you familiar with IPython? Yeah. Cool. What did you want to do? Um, there was the. We're gonna the first question was like showing that string formatting. Yeah. So is there any other questions on the string formatting? We're kind of blowing past that now. Yeah. Okay, and I think you got your question answered. There's, you, you did well. That was a good, that was a good question. Yeah. I learned a little bit of Perl. And we're jumping on to the iPython question. That's even worse somehow. Okay. There we go. Don't touch that wire. All right, what was the... So let's uh, make a virtual environment with Python 3.6. Is that what you were about to do? That's what I was. Or do you, you just have 3.6? Uh, 3.6 installed. So do you just want to start up the IPython? Yeah, I can do that. So Python's an interpreted language, right? Like whatever text you give it, it will execute that mm -hmm. um, at runtime. In the notebooks, you're executing chunks. Um, if you open up just the Python interpreter, you can execute line by line. Same with IPython, um, but IPython adds some added functionality. You can also execute scripts then that are non, that are the, yeah, execute scripts using the interpreter. So, so um, have you ever listened to the Talk Python to Me podcast? Talk Python to me? Yeah. They had the they had the developers of Jupyter and IPython on. Ooh. I don't remember when. It could have been months ago. It was in my feed and I listened to it. Anyway, he talks about the whole history of of IPython, how it went from graduate student project to what it is today and what the differences are between Python and IPython and how Jupyter developed out of that that project. So if you want to know everything there is to know about IPython, go look up that version or that episode. Is that the name of the podcast or the name of the episode? Uh, talk Python to me is the name of the podcast. Um, and I guess talkpython.fm. Uh, yeah, I just went into iTunes and talk Python. Mm -hmm. But um, okay. uh, yeah, talk Python right? um, Dot dot what? FM. This so it was an episode in February of 2016, actually. That uh, they had they had a couple of research scientists that that uh, are involved with them. Um, uh, they're not numbered. Uh, it's just called Project Jupiter and IPython. February second, two thousand sixteen. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. A lot of information in there. Um. Would you, so you started up the iPython uh -huh, yeah. terminal. Um, do you want to do that string operation, like define oh, yeah. bar? Yeah, yeah, we can um, do some abstracts here. So dynamically, unlike a um, static language, we're dynamically declaring the variable and storing that. Um, when he executes that, that actually stores it in, like creates a spot in memory that is that string. And then um, for the syntax, He's formatting 
based on your local variables, and it inserts that var into that location. So this is a different type of syntax. That, hmm? Is it more this, It probably is totally inspired. This is like, inspired by a lot of other languages. So, <laughs> yeah. There is actually a, one of the number one complaints was why did it take so long for us to get this? So, yeah. And then you just look at JavaScript and you're like, well, it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions with um, the notebook? Sure. So, so like, can you edit the cells that you already made in IPython, or is it like what you did with Jupyter? No, or right. is it still just command prompt? Like, it's just command prompt. Um, Jupyter is the same way. You're just re-executing. Right. So, like, say he wanted to go back and set that cell, he would type in var equal. Yeah, you yeah you can't you can so, you can up arrow and, okay, and go yeah. back to. And so, if you renamed var part of history, this but, would be like um, exec re-executing that. Mm -hmm. um, IPython introduced an uh, idea of like a chunk. So if you scroll back up five, six, there. <laughs> so here's a chunk of code that, that he executed all at once, and he just scrolled back up to it. And now he can arrow back through that if he wants and edit a piece of it, and then execute the whole mm -hmm. chunk. And uh, this, this code here I actually wrote in a Jupyter notebook this afternoon. So, <clears throat> so anyway, the, the IPython terminal <laughs> Shares a kernel with the iPy or the Jupyter uh, oh, notebook. Yeah. So the history is stored. The yeah. Same. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So the kernel is the same between the two. They both um, interact with the same one. Do you have a notebook um, that you'd be willing to like pull up? Yeah. Really quick? Well, let's yeah. do. Let's use a little bit of magic in here first, and then. Yeah, but I would say the the I, I the, the IPython is nice over say a normal terminal if you just say Python and I want to like know what files are in this directory and I type ls. It's gonna, it's gonna yell at me uh, uh, that ls doesn't. It's not defined. It's, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but in IPython, you can type ls will oh. tell you. Or if I want a CD into my desktop folder, and I can ls and see what's in there. Or there um, is a, a cool trick you can do with normal Python if you don't have IPython though, where you prefix rl wrap. I learned about this today. Try, try it on the other one. So kill that. No, kill it first, and then rl wrap. Just like that? Yeah, space Python. No. Okay, never mind. You have to have RL wrap. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> it'll give history and control R support to uh, REPLs that mm -hmm. don't have it. So if you you have to be forced to use like the PHP REPL. And uh, <laughs> IPython defines all the same magics that you'd have in the Jupyter. So I, I use PyLab all the time. So I can do PyLab. Uh, which imports NumPy and sets up Matplot Live for you, so that I can just say like plot, like you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing that I really like about IPython as well is the percent save. Oh. The number. Yeah, it's the, I, I didn't know that. I thought it was like range. Yeah. So you can nice. make these plots like nice. that, like all all built in. One of the things that is nice, especially for this, is the default um, thing that this window that Matplotlib pops up is actually interactive. Right. So it, you want to play around with that. Like, uh, that's really your, nice. <laughs> and it doesn't freeze your uh, your interpreter. It, it, if you it have attaches it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So can you go over and just like scroll. It's, kind of, it's cool. It's when you're used to just doing notebooks. Like this is one of the things oh, I miss. Wow. You can just do some dynamic exploration. Yeah. And That's awesome. Zoom in and out. And if you've used Mathematica, it's still laughable um, <laughs> That's fair. what you can do, but it's. <laughs> but at least it's zero data. Yeah. It's, uh, and yeah. uh, there is something that Jake Vanderplas wrote that does a D3 extension for notebooks and Matplotlib, but. Which it, one is that? Uh, is it uh, C? No, no, no it, I think it's. MPL D3. I think it's like oh. some real boring. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> one sec. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Is is PyLab a built-in uh, feature? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I, I I just download Anaconda. Okay. And uh, it's part of the Anaconda. I will I will trust that they got it right. 
Um, and it's part of Anaconda. I don't know that if you just download IPython, if the file app is. It might what fail if it's like. Reinstall Anaconda. Oh, man. This is just linking really well. Do you have any last questions That's on that? Good. Actually, okay. one more thing. So if you make a variable called ls, is that going to overwrite the functionality? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to try it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's brand new. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, um, do you want to do a? This is a really fun Python two to three thing. So, can you open up a two interpreter? Do you have a? It's uh, yeah. like Python. Yeah. This is just for kicks and giggles. So <laughs> fix. Okay, so do uh, a equals true. Oh, you sure. <laughs> do if a uh, like colon. Uh, print. I'm so true. <laughs> okay, cool. Execute that. Great, we all know that. Now do true, type true, equal false. <laughs> okay, now do your if statement again. Nice thing about uh, IPython is it pulls in your, it, it pulls in the, the the multi line mm -hmm. history yeah, so is one. Yeah. So you don't have to redo. Ben, you missed this, but this is how Dylan uh, pranked us one day at work. Where what? He just what it true to false? Yeah. And, uh, no, it? he did it randomly. Which version is. No, no, no. It should. That you should work. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, A equal. Or just, just change the. Yeah. So if true, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Moral relativism. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I gotcha. Got you. <laughs> 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 that doesn't matter anything. So, for a really mean trick, you can, in Python 2.7, do like one every hundred times, set uh, true equal to false. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you. The Python 3, they put down some restrictions. You can't do that anymore. There are some things they're like, nope, we only allow flexibility so much. This, we can't this is allow this. Fun this fun is language. unconscionable. <laughs> We're changing the meaning of truth. <laughs> we can't. Getting rid of the fun. <sighs> so yeah, actually, if you go back to the other interpreter and just try setting true equal to false. This was Dylan's Python 3 demo five yeah. years ago, which yeah. The fact that we're still using Python 2 in a lot of places makes me sad. <laughs> so. I, wonder if, I wonder if you can... Uh, There's a couple others you can't... To others. Yeah, you can't reassign to if. Um, you can't reassign to like keywords. Yeah. If, and, yeah. not. Or. Or, yeah. Interesting. Sweet. <laughs> but how do Interesting. we... What happens to libraries in Anaconda if we reinstall stuff? Who wants to break their anaconda belt? Or you can, you can break it on my machine. I won't use anaconda right now. Well, so yeah, well, a, how do you mean break it? That's a good question. What happens to. Who, who asked this question originally? Before I break my anaconda. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, like, you were like, asking what happens when you reinstall anaconda. If I'm not mistaken, the Anaconda itself, or like substock in Anaconda. <coughs> well, I want to install. Like, if I were to accidentally type that and just blow away the entire Python directory. <coughs> oh, accidentally! <laughs> Ooh, on accident. Took that for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, going back to what Dylan was saying, I was thinking this is probably like an ideal time to use virtual environments for Python to keep your libraries all separated and things like that. Like, will Anaconda work inside of a virtual environment? Um, Anaconda has its own concept concept of uh, back in, uh, virtualization, how it runs the kernel and things like that. And that's so that it can use every freaking CPU on your system slash, well, not every CPU, but it, it'll have a shared kernel. Mm -hmm. um, so it has its own package manager, for mm -hmm. example. It doesn't use pip. You can conda install and conda update and all that other fun stuff. So I think maybe what you're asking is what happens when I do a conda update? Or, okay, so here's or do you have two different repos that are? I'm trying to update um, scikit-learn. So 
but I don't want it to break. I, I want it to still work with like NumPy and SciPy and all those. So I don't have to update all those to have a uh, problem. Con Conda itself is, is not, it's a, it's, a, it's a package distribution tool. And so it, under the hood, it's like Mac ports or brew, and it keeps track of all the dependencies. So if you update Skype, Ski Kit, or whatever it's called, it will automatically update every other library so that it's all compatible across the board. Yeah. So that that is one of the benefits. Of and then they have their own environments. You can do Conda EMB. So I've never used virtual environment, but I use the Conda EMB. Just right. a, awesome. Yeah. So there are Conda environments. Just doing or just doing a quick mm -hmm. search for Google here. Uh, and, and the con environments are nice because the, the way that they do the linking um, takes very little um, disk space right. compared to others. That it, or you can do hard copies if you want of it and create a distributed package that you can just ship off to someone else that's fully, uh, fully self-contained. Now I remember this from doing a data science course and they had a slightly older version of a lot of this stuff. So I just had to set up a separate environment so it wouldn't break everything on other things, so I think this is your trick, is to set up a quantum environment. It sets up one by default. I know that. Um, and then just, yeah, set it aside for whatever project you're working on, and then make sure that you uh, activate it. Yeah. The, the default, what I'm just showing here, the default Python virtual environment is very, like, storage intensive. Yeah. Um, Good question. Is that it you were yeah. on? Okay, sweet. Um, but what happens if I want to install on Windows? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's probably a good. So how do I run or compile Python on Windows? Who asked that one? Oh yeah. Um, so there's that one. Really there's that it. one that <laughs> Python yeah. binary that does like you can actually create binary out of Python that will run. Does anybody use Windows for their Python? I I uh, develop on the Mac, but my tool will run on Windows, so I use uh, Python or PyStaller to build the binary. Oh, that's interesting. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, there's also Py2exe. Oh. I had trouble using that, having the icon show up on the binary, and PyInstaller worked. Yeah, freezing your code. Freezing your code to be created and executable, making a standalone. So just Google it. Yeah. Did any other Windows users have comments? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I honestly, all I did was uh, I just downloaded the. Uh, what's it called, code, um, Visual Studio code, and mm -hmm. then they can just install Python through that, so I don't mm -hmm. have to mess with the Windows stuff. You can just um, do it in, not, in an IDE. Use, yeah, in I also use uh, uh, WSL if I also need to do Python stuff on Windows. So I, I guess I, I try to not bother with it and just take shortcuts. Lexi, didn't you no, instruct her? So, this is the thing we're talking about, like the newer, better version of Citroen. Right. This is it. Oh, okay. WXL. Yeah. Cool. There was another one that was like Buffoon or something. Oh, interesting. That was Windows like subsystem for Windows. Windows. Yeah. That's Lexi, cool. They, it, your, Lexi took an intro to Python course at PyCon this year, and one of them, they told you to install Anaconda, right? Mm -hmm. Off the bat, mm -hmm. for Windows, and that oh, came. Yeah, because I made you these things. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the engineering department here, Mat, MATLAB is it's used by everyone, everywhere, because you just sit down, you type, you, you plug it, you, you kick it on, and it just works every time. And students don't spend half a semester bitching at their computer that this module's not installing. So uh, we're trying to get everyone to switch over to Anaconda. It's, it, maybe it's not the best. What it's it consistent. Do it, but it works every single time, and more students will use it, and then it'll get adopted in industry. Uh, so I would, I just don't, just use Anaconda. And when you are good enough that Anaconda does not satisfy your needs, then you are you are beyond what most Python users will ever. Sweet. So I think we can write down Anaconda VS Code and. I am I am an evangelist for uh, 
Anaconda. I wonder, does anybody, so anybody who's a software engineer, like, so like doing web dev or something else, use Anaconda in a deployment, like a production environment to install this stuff? Interesting question. That, and deploying it to Windows or just in general? Just, just in general. Like, I feel like it would be over. So when, so when right, you, you write some sort of code, um, you're developing it, and then you want to deploy it out to a server to run, maybe as an API or something. Um, typically, you like we use pip to install all those packages um, before sending it out. And, yeah, is Anaconda just overkill for that scenario? Like, do you know of anybody who's using? It? You know, that would be a good question for the data engineering meetup, for the record. But depends on the platform you're using. But like GCP defaults to Docker. Yeah, Google Cloud Platform. Yeah, and so it's so Anaconda is almost under killing that basically. Yeah, that's true. Well, and they, they create images with all of the pre installed packages yeah, already there. I wonder what they're using when they create, because it's when you create those artifacts, when you create that image, I wonder what they're using. I'm sh it's in the Docker file. <laughs> yeah. Probably, like, yeah, uh, yeah I, I just want to say that that is something that I will be doing soon. One of my projects at CHPC is to be writing some program and it's using Matplotlib and we're going to mm -hmm. deploy it to some uh, nodes that are pretty basic and don't have any Python stuff installed. So that is something I will need to figure out pretty soon and maybe I'll report back on that. I'd, I'd also recommend uh, looking at Docker. Mm -hmm. That's the current industry standard for like compartmentalizing your code, creating artifacts, which are um, like the binary that you're going to run, all of the various dependencies actually compiled, mm -hmm. um, and then then deploying that sort of binary on a particular yeah. machine. Yeah. So. I would recommend doing Docker Compose, even if you're doing just one Docker image, because it makes it 10 times easier. Um, and there are, there are images out there you can build on top of. So there's yeah. images that will come installed with Python, uh, Matplotlib, and like those. You could run things. entire, yeah. yeah. One, I, this is just, this is totally going off in a different direction, but I thought it was really interesting. Um, at the data engineering meetup, you were there, Ferris. The, the idea of having it be, of not uh, saying what your dependencies are during your coding. So in your development environment, you wouldn't actually specify what versions of your packages you're using. Oh, yeah, that's actually what I was moving us toward. Um, I was using, uh, there's a really good one called pipenv. Has anybody heard of or used that? Um, yeah, so pip is great. Pipenv is better because it'll not, when you do like a pip freeze, it'll take everything that's ever installed. Pipenv will know exactly what you explicitly said. Um, and are you going to show a pip file? Are you going to show our pip file? <laughs> uh, you can. It's been it's been cleared now. So well, I mean, there's no, there wouldn't be any. Yeah, their timeline is a Python dev workflow for humans. Yeah. So pipenv will take care of this. So this is ours. Some somebody at some point committed. Well, and I think this is how a lot of projects local. are. It was kind of a yeah. it's kind of a different paradigm. So in this, even in our dev environment, we're specifying all the versions of everything that work together. And the different uh, concept is to actually, you wouldn't have any of this. You would let the pip uh, figure it all out in your dev environment. And if anything breaks while you're devving, that's the opportunity to upgrade to whatever new fancy thing. If SciPy suddenly like, provides some new thing, that would be your time as part of that point to actually do your migration. So you can do those migrations smaller as part of your regular dev flow. And then when you create your artifact that you're going to uh, deploy to your machine, that's when you actually like freeze your versions and right. say, okay, I'm going to deploy this version with all of these dependencies, and that's when you do the freezing, but it's not during your dev. Like, right. you have to during your dev, dev, you could still do stuff like, for example, for us, we would say Django less than 1.9 um, or less than 1.10 to make sure that we have the latest version of Django um, one nine, including the minor version, so I wouldn't have to keep looking up the minor version, and it would just 
auto freeze the new one. Um, please ignore the fact that we're still on one eight. Uh, <laughs> so when you're saying that it's updating, what's prompting those updates? Oh, uh, when so. Well, uh, I guess that depends on how you're <coughs> setting when you're, up your dev. So you're running the pip install, it's doing a quick check against that file. But something that we did explicitly is we actually take an MD5 hash in our circle CI build of that file now. Do you know we do this now? Yeah. And then if it sees that there's a difference in that, it just reinstalls everything by default. So we have a conditional in there that says, hey, here's the old hash. Um, does it compare? Yes. Okay, just use the cache. Otherwise, the build's going to take forever. Oh, wait, it changed? Okay, reinstall it because somebody changed this. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and Circle CI lets you do that really easily. Yeah, and in this, the, the par like one of the paradigms could be that like you don't rebuild your environment as often and don't always think about it, right? But when you push to your Circle CI, like for GitHub, um, Circle CI just like compiles your code and runs it, right? That's when it could check all, it could just rerun the dependencies, rebuild, because it be, builds the environment from scratch anyway, so it could do it without all of the dependencies. Um, it goes through it and says, okay, here's what broke from, this is why you want to have unit tests, but here's what broke from your unit tests. And um, our Doku also will do that, by the way. If you look at... Is that another continuous integration? Uh, Doku is like... Is that Heroku and Docker? It's, it's an open source replacement for Heroku. It's currently powering SLC Python, so you can just go to our GitHub slash SLC Python slash SLCPy.com, and you'll see a good example of um, how we're using Docu for Docker images that are just automatically uh, pushed up. It's two Ks and no C. Yeah. And if you're running DigitalOcean, by the way, they have a container that'll run this for you, and then all you have to do is just say, hey, I... I have this uh, Heroku prop file and just push it up, and then that'll take care of updates for you. There's so many different ways to skin a cat. <laughs> ah! You just take that because. Like I just wondering software. how they did all the little Heroku. images, sorry. Yes, so <laughs> Heroku used to be, well, it still is kind of the hotness, but it's also the hotness in terms of the lava hole it'll burn in your wallet when you try to like deploy anything at all even something that's just a hobby project, it's kind of pricey. Um, it's a great go-to if you just need something like spun up quickly, but Heroku pricing is, I don't know, it's off the wall. Sorry? Google Cloud? I haven't used Google Cloud, I can't speak to that. I know that you have to do a bit of setup. It's a lot like that, what you described in your presentation for Docker. Oh, okay. Because you fire up an image, Docker image, you deploy your code, you do a virtual land, but you have to specify a library directory, and then you just develop against it and push it. There's a really good PyCon talk from 2000 and I believe 16, and it was like pushing up your production Python in five different ways, and he did a live demo where he did like just four or five different ways, and he like literally just posted something manually, and then he did like uh, Heroku, and then he, yeah. Ah, I forgot what it was. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody see this? Didn't play. A lot of the- the number. Huh? Maybe it was a five. <laughs> but anyway, there was a um, bunch of different ways What to year, do you know what year it was? I think it was 2016. <laughs> 2016, maybe 2015, I don't know. For just a little bit extra, these are really awesome talks online. Like, uh, I watched one that was all about how Python's hashing works under the hood, and oh, that they, was one they yeah, force, yeah. he forces collisions and stuff because of how he knows that the yeah, hash, right. hash works and stuff like that, and he's like, this is how you Brandon, can, Brandon can do the Rhodes. worst thing, yeah. Brandon Rhodes is one of the best presenters um, at PyCon. Uh, but there's lots of really yeah. good talks, and Ferris's is going to be up here soon, so. Interesting. Um, <laughs> given my current speaking demeanor, probably not. Anyway, tab pi, do we want to touch on that, or do we want to get into this email classification? You can go to that one first. Tab pi? Okay. Okay, I think, yeah, I agree. We, we should knock this one out, because I think this is going to be our biggest one. 
Let's do the email classification. Yeah, if you want to just have a... No, oh, I mean, this, this laptop has been here for a year. <laughs> Careful. I don't, I mean, should I be? You know, this is a, so they teach a course here where they teach like very basic computing 101. This is a oh. computer, this is the parts of a computer. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's needed if you're like yeah. a uni student who like grew up without computers. I, guess. I don't know. This is a hard drive? Yeah. <laughs> they used to have a dead server in there too. Did they? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, just. Yeah. Should we go back to, to Derek's talk? Because I kind of liked that, like, his nat if natural language processing. What part of this are you curious about? Um, how would you guys approach... Um, classifying the, the email? Yeah, classifying it. What are we looking for in the email, specifically? Um, so this is, this is the part of the, like, machine learning where it's like, it's just a bunch of if statements versus like it's smarter if statements. Are you only concerned with the body? Is that it? Yeah, I'm only concerned too concerned with the body. Okay, so we can already hash out that. So first you build a pipeline, it sounds like. I think data engineering is something that Dylan's always talking about, is actually the hard part of machine learning now. Yeah. Um, machine learning is fairly straightforward now. You just throw more CPU cores at it and find somebody's library and hope that somebody who's really good with like theoretical anything has already made a library for you to use practically. Mm -hmm or you can try making one on your own and get your PhD. So, um, so the pipeline, I think, is where we should start, right? So there we go. First thing, pull out the body from your email. Um, do you already have a way that you're receiving these emails? Like, It's through Outlook, is one way. Um, so is that what you're talking about? Or I can, let me tell you some of the stuff we're doing at Team. Yeah. It's not IT, right? it's a fairly open thing. Oh, like what our product actually is? Our meeting services and desk identifier stuff. What? People, yeah. Anyway, so what we did it's is... It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um, <laughs> we have an inbox set up per desk and per meeting service. And basically how it works is somebody will invite that meeting service to a uh, meeting, right? To like a Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar. Thing. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it'll take that... Um, and what happens is like Google sends you an invite, right? You've ever gotten a Google Calendar invite? We're taking the ICS or the iCal file that comes from that, we parse it out, and then we do stuff too. Mm. So there's the first part of your pipeline. Mm. We use Mandrill to do that. Mailgun's another option that'll take care of that stuff. Um, and basically, or you can just set up an SMTP. But what's nice about this is it'll, again, going back to APIs, send us a RESTful API webhook, which is just a post to our server, to say, hey, I got this email, what do you want to do with it? Here's the raw body. We take that raw body, and in your case, we take out the body. So we're going to pretend all that data pipeline stuff is set up, and now we're right here. So, um, so what are you trying to classify? Do you, are you curious about the NLP part or the classification part? The, the NLP part, like, what are the... How would you think about, how would you go about it, high level and then medium level, you know what I mean? Just kind of okay. Yeah. I, so the, the NLP part, in, in, yeah, I would... NLTK is a great yeah, there's, Python library to start with, you probably know. The NLTK? natural language toolkit. Didn't we do um, natural language process like three months ago. We yeah. did, so that was going to be the second part. Is Bob Davis, I believe, give that. No, remember. it wasn't Bob. Bob Davis? has given one, or maybe he didn't give it here. He's given talks before. Derek gave it. Derek gave one, yeah, and that was, yeah. That was a chat bot, though. Yeah, so. But it, has, it had an NLP inject yeah. behind yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, for, for the actual par parsing of NLP. It's online, yeah. What, NLP is a very common problem, mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of services and libraries already built in, so there's, they're like AWS uh, um, has like endpoints where you just send them your text and they send you back like you want to do um, something like a uh, what's the sentiment analysis right mm -hmm. so like I want to pull out that I'm really <coughs> angry at Ferris for being a jerk yeah, so and I classify all the angry emails right mm -hmm. and then they give me back with the tags 
And then you could use those tags with whatever other metadata you want. So like if I know what type of user, like um, I'm a white male, and you want to like, how much does white male predict angry? <laughs> like, <laughs> or some sentiment. And the NLP part, uh, you are outsourcing to some tool um, and not really building that part yourself. Um, and then depending on the type of classification you want to do, so I, was, I just described a prediction. But if you just want to classify like um, whether this email used, you know, like you have some classification used swear words, right? And it's true or false, right? You, there are parsers out there for yeah. that already. And you would just send, it, send the text to that service, get back the, the parsed out tags. Like you said earlier, you have a whole bunch of data. You have a, you have a whole bunch of data wherein you have some emails that were manually parsed and some other else. Yeah, so <coughs> label. Right, and then you like, yeah. and you want to build a model that will allow, then allow you to get a new one and then decide whether or not you need to be on the first or do the actual handle parts. No, whether it needs to be manually handled. Yeah. 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 And did you guys recommend related to what you were just saying, do you guys recommend some of those um, endpoints, I think you called it, some of those services, like the machine learning services and other things? It depends on the data. It depends on on the uh, if it's email, sometimes I get worried about personally identifiable information and stuff that you have to keep private mm -hmm. and what you're willing to trust to a service. Because you're just giving it to Google or right. Amazon or whatever. Right, so mm -hmm. some of those I would be wary of, but it depends on your use case. Um, mm -hmm. There are some services out there like Mailinator, and they're totally all about, we don't care if anybody sees this email, that's just how you look up like the email address. So, yeah. Well, the stuff we're more optimized for like, I used one for uh, like my Python final project that was optimized for doing like Alexa type work. Then it would just handle like short sentences. It was really good at intent from spoken language versus huge blocks of text. Right. And a lot of the ones, if you're trying to get a very simple message out of a huge block of text, start to get a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is what Derek used for his talk. Was uh, Rasa? Yeah. So he oh, cool. he had a um, he had like an API layer. Uh, a chatbot that parsed the chatbot text and communication, and then an NLP processing layer. And he had just spun up each in Docker containers that talked via HTTP, HTTP requests. And these were a couple of the options. There was IBM Watson, he said, open NLP. This Rasu NL worked pretty good. So you give it a sentence like this, I'm looking for a Mexican restaurant in the center of town. And uh, based on the uh, examples that you give it of like here's a sentence here's the intent here's a sentence and you give it like a hundred or a thousand of these and examples and then it, the, it builds a model to interpret the text and it does a lot of cool things under the hood where it tokenizes and um, ranks it um, and then even saves content and things like that yeah and, and so it, it builds up your uh, intent model and then you can just pass new sentences and even words that you didn't use, <coughs> like it'll it'll do swapped out of common words and stuff. So, uh, cool. yeah, and then and then it'll give you out particular entities that you tag in your examples. And it'll say, here's the thing that you wanted, and it's then it's structured data. So you take the the natural language and structure. And when you set up all these models. Um, some, some people outsource this part, by the way, where I have like 10,000 sentences and they need them classified and they'll use uh, Mechanical Turk, which is he's, hilarious. You might have missed, he said that he he's already done some class, like okay. labeling. So he already has the labeling? Yeah, already but has if the you didn't, That would be an option. Mechanical Turk is an API for people. Yeah. Like, seriously, yeah. you, you set them up with problems and they give you answers that only a human can solve for now. <laughs> so this is a uh, one of their their input files. So like all of these sentences mean the intent check balance, and so you give it a bunch of examples. Intent, you have some sort of greeting, and give it more and more examples. And then when you pass, you you build up that model, and then it actually provides an API layer to access the 
uh, result even lower. Did we want to touch on Tableau 5? No, I think we're good. Yeah. Cool. All right. I want to take a second to thank Dylan. I put him on the spot. Um, <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. I You're okay. Your, <laughs> I saw your passive aggressive email. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be passive aggressive. I'm trying to get to intent, right? Yeah. Like that's... And yeah, and Tim, I thank you for your insight. No problem. I put you on the teaching spot. Elements in yeah. the uh, web development area. But, but yeah, let's give a round of applause for these kids. <laughs> and I think for those who stuck by. Yeah. I think you two have definitely earned a sticker. Would you like a big sticker or a small sticker? I'll take a big one. Yeah? So, um, are these the big ones or the small ones? I think these are the big ones. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dylan, so, would you like a large right. sticker or a small sticker? Small sticker. I can't find a small sticker. I'll take a big sticker. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You're going to have fun with this. What was the last number we got to? It should be marked. Oh, oh yeah, you marked it. So we got to 21. So 22 because it's 0. Minus 1 because I'm not going to participate because I'm 0 because I've already got the thousands. Um, there we go. That's a magic variable. You should put number of Pythonistas instead of 21. <laughs> There we go. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Code that, for people. Is that why you rewrite it? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Dylan's writing it right now. Always oh, code like the next guy's on the title. <laughs> 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 oh. oh, too much fun. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's, let's randomize. Yeah, and rand, and one, two. Tab completions. Also. One, 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 it's inclusive. Oh, it, is. it is. If you look at rand in zero, one, uh, one, zero, one. So that's inclusive. Yeah. But <laughs> that is not what I meant to do. Yeah, that's a really nice thing about IPython is it maintains that history. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Winner is <laughs> <laughs> Number nine. A lot of people left because they're university students. 19? All right. Nice. Congrats. You have a choice between any of this stuff. Oh man, you guys are awesome. Um, wh which one would you recommend? Uh, everybody who loves Jake Vanderpuss. Yeah, I'll so. go for this. Right. Sounds good. Wait, wait, come back. You get to also draw the next person. Okay. So you want to just it's, you hit enter. Hit enter. Yes. All right. Twenty-one. 21. Matt. Mm -hmm. And a couple stickers. You can enter, Daniel. Seven. Yeah. And prize. Number one. Yeah. Oh, huh? Our next meeting is a meetup is the seventh. Um, there's probably going to be extra pizza if you're a college student or you know college students or you just want extra pizza. Feel free to grab some on your way out. Otherwise, I'm just going to throw it in the trash, which kind of sucks. Um, yeah, and then I need to grab Brian and Brian? Dustin. Dustin. So I'll see you after class. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. Sorry that it wasn't as uh, organized as it could have been, but I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, stay warm and dry and enjoy the rain this week, and I'll see you all in a month. Cool. Thanks, nice meeting you, Taurus. You as well. Thank you yeah. for stepping up, Tim. No problem. Right.